The results of last weekend's election in Venezuela represent a very serious defeat for the Bolivarian Revolution. The final results, as I speak, have not yet been uh, announced, but it is clear that the opposition has won with, I think, 7.4 million votes against about 5.5 million for the Chavista uh, PSUV. The Chavistas have lost in all the main cities. Even in such a stronghold of the revolution as the uh, 23 Enero uh, poor suburb of, uh, of Caracas, they, they lost albeit by a small, uh, a small amount. In the provinces they've been heavily defeated also in the agrarian areas, the peasant areas, even in Barinas, where Chavez and his family of course uh, originated. So from any point of view this is a very, very serious defeat which will have extremely serious consequences. Now I've no doubt of course that this will be the cause for celebration, the, the champagne corks will be popping in Washington and in the city of London and Wall Street and so on and so forth. Certainly it will give uh, encouragement to the uh, counter-revolutionary opposition. You'll get all the uh, rabid, uh, hysterical, petty bourgeois elements celebrating and dancing for joy in the streets of every city and town and village of Venezuela. And the question that, that must be uh, addressed here is why did this happen? First of all, it must be noted that the Bolivarian Revolution has lasted for 17 years, which is quite extraordinary. And throughout all of this period, of course, from the very beginning, the, the counter-revolution, the oligarchy and its forces, were determined to overthrow this uh, revolution, which of course represented a fundamental turning point in the history, the destinies, not just of Venezuela, but the whole of uh, Latin America. Uh, let us recall the fact that uh, in Venezuela, before Chavez, the masses were entirely excluded and alienated from the political setup, the so-called democracy, which, by the way, slaughtered uh, thousands of its own citizens on the streets in the Caracato of uh, 1989, something which is never discussed uh, in, in these days. And in the person of Hugo Chavez, a man who I had the, uh, the honour and the pleasure of being personally acquainted with and uh, uh, discussed with him many times about the political uh, problems of the Venezuelan Revolution, in the person of Chavez, for the first time, these oppressed, downtrodden, uh, expropriated masses felt that they, that, 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 that they were being represented for the first time ever, that they had a voice and they had an idea, which was the idea of socialism, as Chavez subsequently explained. This is a colossal achievement, which nobody can take that away from the Venezuelan people. And by the way, the international Marxist tendency, which I represent, uh, which set up hands off Venezuela uh, over a decade ago, are proud of the fact that we were the first ones, I would say the only ones internationally, that defended and understood the nature of the Bolivarian Revolution from the outset. And we remain committed supporters of the Bolivarian uh, Revolution, despite what has happened. But you see, at the same time, we also understood the limitations of, the, of this revolution. Let me just quote you something, if I may, which I wrote in May 2004. That's over a decade ago. That's right at the beginning. Before Chavez announced his uh, support for socialism, I wrote the following. It is impossible to consolidate the gains of the revolution within the limits of the capitalist system. Sooner or later, the choice will have to be made. Either the revolution liquidates the economic power of the oligarchy, expropriates the bankers and capitalists, and moves in the direction of socialism, 
or the oligarchy and imperialism will liquidate the revolution. This is what I pointed out uh, in 2004, and repeated it many times since, both in conversations with President Chavez, with whom I had a very good close uh, uh, friendship, if you like, and on television, and in Venezuela on television, in mass meetings, in factories, to mass meetings of peasants in the villages, and so on. I hammered home constantly the, the, this, this theme. Either we will liquidate uh, the oligarchy, or the oligarchy ultimately will liquidate us. Now, of course, uh, we, we, we can expect all kinds of uh, strange interpretations of what's occurred in, in Venezuela. The first explanation is socialism, you see, has failed yet again. Well, no, my friends, no, not in the slightest degree. Socialism did not fail in Venezuela for the simple reason that socialism was never introduced into Venezuela. What you had was half a revolution, a hybrid of capitalism and elements of socialism, if you like, elements of public ownership and so on, which of course we supported insofar as it went. Yes, but you see, it is impossible to have such a hybrid. All of history, and particularly the history of Latin America demonstrates one thing. It is impossible to make half a revolution. It's about time that people also in Europe on the left began to wake up to this fact. It is impossible, my friends, to make half a revolution. And if you try to do this, you will end up with the worst of all worlds, with the worst of both worlds, which is precisely, unfortunately, what occurred in, in, in Venezuela. Because despite the fact that they did carry through very important reforms, by the way, this must not be forgotten, those who now try to argue, well, the revolution was failed, it was a waste of time, well, not so, not so. The Bolivarian revolution made extraordinary gains for the people in the forms of free health, free education, the Bolivarian University, the Misiones, and so on. For the first time, people had access, poor people had access to education, to health, and to the other benefits of society in a country which was swimming with oil. The wealth of Venezuela, the oil wealth of Venezuela, was never shared among, among the mass of the populations in a way that the, uh, the Bolivarian revolution succeeded in doing. So that was certainly worthwhile. From the standpoint of the masses, and those gains undoubtedly will remain in the consciousness of the masses in, in Venezuela. Yes, but, yes, but, all this, good as it was, was not sufficient. It was not enough. They carried out some nationalizations, yes, all very good. Unfortunately, they eliminated the workers' control, which, uh, which started to exist and, uh, in the early days of the revolution, was eliminated by this uh, cancer of bureaucracy, which again played a huge role in undermining what was, the, what was this great revolution? Agrarian reform, they, yes, they gave some land to some peasants, but by and large, the economic power of the oligarchy, by which I mean the bankers, landowners, and capitalists, remained intact. Yes, they talked about it. They talked about it, even recently. Maduro, Nicolas Maduro, who I know, the president, talked about uh, taking action against capitalists. And yet, and yet, what was done? Words, my friends, words, speeches, rhetoric. Long live socialism, long live the revolution. Yes, and how many people in Europe, reformists and left reformists, who eventually, rather late in the day, I might say, jumped on the bandwagon of support for the Bolivarian Revolution, like people like Vickirk in, uh, in Britain who split the Solidarity Movement, deliberately split the movement, in order to, to destroy the influence of Hans of Venezuela, which they didn't succeed in, in doing. But these guys were not supporting, let's be clear about this, these guys were not supporting the Venezuelan Revolution. They were not supporting socialism because they don't believe in socialism, these people. That's the truth of the matter. They were not supporting the workers and peasants of Venezuela. They were supporting uh, the bureaucracy. Their links were with the bu this cancer of bureaucracy, what Chavez called 
the counter-revolutionary bureaucracy. And this brings me on to another, uh, another point. The other explanation, we're already seeing this uh, on Facebook and so on, which I don't uh, personally follow, but I'm informed about this. Oh yes, these creatures come out of the woodwork and they try to blame the working class. Oh, they always blame the working class, don't they? These creatures, they always blame these middle class uh, idiots. They blame the masses. It's the masses for the masses, my friends. How can you blame the people of Venezuela who through thick and thin, through the most difficult periods, have been the mo real motor force of this revolution? The real motor force was not Chavez. Chavez acted as, as the leader, as, as the focal point, as the catalyst, if you like. But the real motor force of this revolution was the masses, the workers, the peasants, the poor people, the unemployed, the women, and so on. That was the real strength that saved the revolution at every critical point, like in the coup d'etat, which they carried out in 2002. It was defeated for the first time in the history of Latin America by a popular uprising. And by the way, at that time, one word from Chavez would have been enough to eliminate capitalism and landlessness in Venezuela. There's no question about this. Or subsequently, the, <clears throat> the bosses' uh, sabotage of the oil industry. At every stage, the masses always responded. Yes, but you see, there's a limit to all things, is there not? There's a limit to the patience of the masses. Seventeen years, good heavens above, that the masses always responded. You know, this reminds me, if one wants to draw an historical analogy, because every analogy has its limits, we know. But it reminds me a bit of the French Revolution, the Great French Revolution of uh, 1789 to 93. But again, it was the masses, the, the, the poor people of Paris, the sans-culottes, who always responded whenever Robespierre called, they came out, they'd come onto the streets to defend the revolution, as the Venezuelan masses always came and responded in every election. They gave a victory to, they handed victory to the Bavarians, despite all the difficulties and problems. Yes, the masses in France also, the sans-culottes, the poor people, they always came out to the streets until one day they did not come out to the streets because they were disappointed, because they were disillusioned, because their hopes had not been fulfilled. And at that point, of course, once the masses failed to respond, Robespierre fell and lost his head. Well, of course, uh, there are differences, but nevertheless, there's a striking similarity. Anyone certainly myself, anyone that knows Venezuela, that has been regularly to Venezuela, couldn't fail to notice a, a, a certain uh, considerable process of disappointment, of demoralization, particularly among the activists, but among the masses also, whose hopes had not been realized, whose hopes had been repeatedly disappointed. And at the roots of this is what? It's the failure it's not the failure of socialism. It's the failure to carry through the socialist revolution to, to the end. I am certain that uh, Hugo Chavez uh, meant, meant to do this. I have no doubt about it. He's an honest man that I, I knew quite well. And you could see this in his last, when he was dying of cancer, in his last speech to the Council of Ministers, which is published in a, pam a pamphlet called, uh, you can get it now, called, uh, what was it? Uh, Gope de, Tim de, 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 de Timon, a change of course, roughly translated in, in English. You can see the frustration in this speech when he confronted his ministers. What have you people done? What have you done to give power to the people to, to develop the communes and so on and so forth? Yes, he was frustrated. He died a frustrated man. I am sorry to say, but the, the heritage is there. The heritage, the idea of the, the socialist revolution, which uh, Chavez put forward, is there. Yes, but unfortunately this idea, this marvellous idea of the socialist revolution became a mere phrase, rhetoric, speeches. And of course, all these ladies and gentlemen in London and other cities uh, who went as tourists at the invitation of the Bolivarian government would applaud. Oh yes, long live Chavez, long live the revolution. Yes, there were people like that in Venezuela also. What I call the fifth column, the bureaucracy, the reformists, who never believed in the socialist revolution, who do not believe in the socialist revolution, who are opposed to the socialist revolution. 
but of course who crawl on their bellies and applaud and grovel and, and sliver in front of any existing power as they did to Chavez when he was alive and afterwards. And these reformists played, played a lamentable role. You, you have them in Venezuela now, people with red shirts, eh, shouting the praises of the revolution, and in practice are careerists, bureaucrats, as Chavez said, counter-revolutionary bureaucracy. Now look, the masses played a heroic role. The ordinary people, the peasants, the workers, well, risked their lives. Some of them lost their lives in the struggle against the counter-revolution. Oh yes, the masses. You couldn't ask more. What more could you ask of the masses, of the workers, of the peasants in Venezuela more than what they did for the last 17 years? Okay, and the masses are prepared to sacrifice. Now the excuse is put forward by uh, Maduro and others. Oh no, we lost the economic war. Is an economic war? Well, of course, that's true. But there was an economic war. There was undoubtedly sabotage by the landlords, the capitalists, the oligarchy. That's true. Uh, that was responsible for a lot of the economic problems, the shortages of food, and so this is proven, yes. It was part of the explanation. Yes, but that begs the question, doesn't it? So many denunciations of the capitalists and so on, of the owners of Polar, what's it, Mendoza, Lorenzo Mendoza, this counter-revolutionary and so on. Yes, but what was done? These people should have been expropriated. They, that, that was the only way, as, expl as I explained in 2004. The only way to defeat the counter-revolution was to destroy the economic power of the oligarchy. By the way, that's equally true for Britain, and Greece, and France, and Spain, as what it is for Venezuela. They failed to do this, and now you see the consequence. The, inevit the inevit inevitable consequence, as I would say. Yes, the counter-revolution has won. The masses uh, did make sacrifices, are prepared to make sacrifices. Yes, of course, but the masses will make sacrifices, first of all, if they're sure that everyone is making a sacrifice. My friends, everyone in Venezuela was not making the same sacrifice. They could see these bureaucrats, these reformers, these career, careerists, like the ones we have in the Parliamentary Labour Party in Britain, okay? Who made no sacrifice, who was just there to fill their pockets, to further their careers, to sit on the backs of the masses and exploit them. As simple as that. And therefore, I know for a fact that this produced a burning anger, a burning, seething sense of indignation among the activists for a start, and the masses. Now you see, is it true to say that the opposition of the right wing won this election? Well, that's only relatively true. Because if you take the trouble to look at the figures, which are provisional, but they're practically complete, you will find the following. The votes for the counter revolution the votes for the opposition, have not dramatically increased, at least in relation to the result of the presidential election of 2013, which was their high point. Okay? What is true is that the Bolivarians have lost 2 million votes in respect to those elections. That indicates a colossal demoralization, a disappointment of people that are, that are now have lost all hope, if you like, in relation to the revolution, because of the leadership. It's a problem, of, not of the masses, it's a problem of the leadership. Oh, and these same wretched careerists in Europe, these opportunities these reformers, what are they say? Of course, they blame the masses, of course, naturally. Yes, the masses are prepared to, to, to sacrifice their today for their tomorrow, as Trotsky explained, only to a certain point. And the conditions are quite intolerable now in Venezuela. Because what this hybrid of capitalism and socialism, which, by the way, Chavez said was impossible. In my presence, he spoke at a meeting where he announced his adherence to socialism, his conversion to socialism, if you like. He said the following, there is no third way, okay? There's no, no third way between capitalism and socialism. Either you have capitalism or socialism, you can't have both. And therefore, the idea that you could combine somehow capitalism and sources, you could combine the, the interests of the workers and, 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 the, and the bosses, led to complete disaster, chaos. You had a cha chaotic situation of food shortages, of colossal inflation, of a colossal deficit and so on. Because of the, uh, by the, by the way, the deficit, the, the budget deficit, largely caused, by the way, by what? By printing money. 
QE. But isn't that what uh, the left reformers are advocating in Britain, the supporters of Corbyn? Isn't that what they're advocating? In Spain, at Podemos and so on? Oh, print money. You print money, my friends, you get what you had in Venezuela. No, 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 this is not, this is, this is all nonsense. And what is particularly disgusting, what's particularly scandalous, I, re I read today statements by one of the leaders of, of Podemos, who I know, who was one of Chavez's advisors, by the way. God save us from Chavez's advisors. That's all I've got to say about that uh, subject. Juan Carlos Monadero, I had an argument with him after, when I went to, to, to Venezuela after Chavez died. Absolute uh, nonsense, the man talks. And you know what his analysis is? What his advice is? He advised, he gave bad advice to Chavez when he was alive, and now he's giving bad advice to the Bolivians. He says, oh yes, don't worry, the opposition has won, but we should negotiate with them. You know, they're reasonable. Maduro has shown he's a reasonable chap by, by uh, saying that uh, he'd lost the election. Uh, fair enough. So now the opposition ought to be reasonable in return. I ask you, Comrade Monadero, my dear friend, what planet are you living on? Good heavens above. You expect reasonable behavior? I'll tell you what will happen in Venezuela. They won't be reasonable, these guys. After 17 years of constant defeats of humiliation and uh, socialism, as they would say, communism even, as they would call it, they will want revenge. These rabid petty bulls with these elements that are dancing on the streets, they'll be dancing on the graves of Bolivarian activists very soon. You better bet, you, you bet your life on it. There's no question of an agreement here. They will want revenge. Not a nice dialogue in the national interest as Comrade Monadero in his uh, madness uh, if, believes is possible on the country. There's no question of any uh, agreement here. They will be out for blood. The employers are already saying they want to change the labour laws. Of course they will. They'll privatise everything that's not, not nailed down. And of course there will be mass sackings in the process. Sackings, cutting of living standards. Oh yes, somebody, somebody said, well, perhaps they will not uh, lay hands on the welfare state because it will be, it's one of the gates. What nonsense. Don't you understand there's a huge deficit? The oil has gone down the pan. Oil is now $37 uh, a barrel. It used to be 140 uh, when, when Chavez was alive at one stage. And the cupboard is bare. And therefore the opposite, even the smart ones, even the ones that are not completely crazy and would like some kind of a deal, will find that there isn't the resources. And they will wield the knife. They will wield the hatchet, be sure of it. This, is, this will be counter-revolution, the real face of counter-revolution, especially if they get a two-thirds majority, which seems to be possible. <clears throat> the last figure that, that they issued was 110 seats. They need 111 to get a two-thirds majority. And then, of course, they will go for the jugular. They'll go for Maduro. They'll go for everything. And, of course, at every level, there'll be a counter-revolution. Like in France, under Thermidor, read your history books. They'll be swaggering. They, they, they will say, well, we're... We're the bosses now, and we're going to take revenge. Now, I would like to, to finish on, on a positive note, because uh, this isn't the end. It is the end of one thing. It's the end of, of, a, of a futile attempt to make half a revolution, to, to do what Monadero suggesting, to do a deal with capitalism. This is nonsense. These people have got the cheek to call themselves realists. They're not realists. They're the worst kind of utopians. I'll tell you what will happen. They will, they will wield the knife. They will try to push the wheel of history back. Yes, but, my friends, you see the Chavista movement was defeated but not entirely eradicated. 5.5 million votes is still a powerful mass base. And to the degree that these guys attack, and they will attack, I'll predict now it won't be easy for them. The counter-revolutionaries are not going to have an easy, easy ride here. There will be an explosion after a delay, because at the moment the masses are in a state of shock, and the activists in particular are in a state of shock. But to the degree that the bourgeois uh, go onto the offensive, and they will, these are rabid counter-revolutionaries, they'll go onto the offensive. They will provoke, they'll go too far. They will undoubtedly go too far, and they will provoke uh, at a certain stage a new wave of strikes, of demonstrations, of clashes, and so on and so forth. In opposition, the Bolivarian movement can recover. Yes, it can recover. What is dead in, uh, in, in Venezuela is not uh, the socialist revolution. 
which was never given a chance. What's dead in Venezuela, what's dead and buried is reformism. This defeat is a result of the crimes of reformism. And that's a warning, by the way, to Jeremy Corbyn and to Podemos and to the other left leaders in Europe. That's what happens if you try to conciliate the bourgeoisie. It is a fatal mistake, it's a foolish mistake. And it leads precisely to the defeat which we've seen. It's not over. The, uh, the battle, the new battles will occur. The Bolivarian uh, movement is not dead. It will recover. But it must recover only on one basis. Only, it can only recover on one basis. And that's to say that it learns the lessons of history. And it stands firmly on the grounds of the socialist revolution which Hugo Chavez proclaimed correctly and was never carried through to the end. That's the only way in which the Bolivarian Revolution can revive and can succeed in achieving an ultimate victory.